On today's story session, a tale about an honest guy with amazing abilities who gets totally screwed over just because he's kind of weird. This is Rumpelstiltskin. My name is Zach Stewart, and these are the Shadow Bear Story Sessions. Welcome to the Shadow Bear Story Sessions, the podcast about how brutally dark and totally insane folk tales and fairy tales used to be. Which, in my opinion, just made them way better and more entertaining. So I've got the most true-to-the-original version of Grimm's fairy tales that I could find, and we're going through it front-to-back, story by story. We'll figure out the intended lessons of each story and the actual lessons of each story. And at the end of the episode, I'll adapt the tale into a movie or TV show. Let's get right to it with today's tale, titled Rumpelstiltskin. Another classic. We begin. Once upon a time there was a miller who was poor, but he had a beautiful daughter. Now one day he happened to talk to the king, and said, I have a daughter who knows the art of transforming straw into gold. Why would he just, why would he just say that? Oh, you know what? It's probably a, like a panic move. I mean, he's just a poor miller, so why is he even talking to the king to begin with? He probably crossed paths with the king by sheer chance found himself in a surprise conversation, felt the need to say something impressive because he's literally talking to the king and just spouted off the first thing that came to mind, which was that his daughter can transform straw into gold, I guess, just to try to try to impress this guy. But that was his mistake. He went too big with the lie. That totally happens in real life, too. People say some bullshit to sound good, then the thing they said was too good or too interesting or too noteworthy, so then people ask follow-up questions that the person is totally not prepared for. This is is definitely that situation. Just tried to impress the king and just going way too big with it. We continue. So the king had the miller's daughter summoned to him right away and ordered her to spin all the straw in a room into gold in one night. And if she couldn't do this, she would die. Okay, well, calm the hell down, king. First off, even if she can turn straw into gold, the king doesn't know how it works, how long it takes, or how much she can do in a single night. Wouldn't wouldn't he be like, wow, that's crazy that you can do that. How does that work? Can I see you do it? Instead, he locks her in a room with a bunch of straw and is like, make it gold tonight or you die. That is psychotic. I mean, think of... Think of something even less impressive than turning straw into gold. Someone's like, hey, I can make the best cake you've ever tasted. And the king responds to this by locking that person in the kitchen with a thousand pounds of flour and eggs and says, turn all these ingredients into cake by morning or I'll fucking kill you. It's like, whoa, buddy, calm down. That's not how this works. Why are you deciding on these random super high stakes parameters? Anyway, the father is probably feeling pretty guilty at this point, and yet again, the father in one of these folktales has totally screwed over his daughter and gotten her into a horribly dire situation. Man, these these folktale fathers are the worst. We continue. Then she was locked in the room where she sat and wept. For the life of her, she didn't have the slightest inkling of how to spin straw into gold. Yeah, she's probably really confused how she even got into this situation. Just like, oh my god, my dad is a fucking idiot and now I've got to die because of it. Yep, welcome to the world of folktale dads. All of a sudden, a little man entered the room and said, What will you give me if I spin everything into gold? She took off her necklace and gave it to the little man, and he did what he promised. The next morning, the king found the entire room filled with gold. But because of this... His heart grew even greedier, and he locked the miller's daughter in another room full of straw that was even larger than the first, and she was to spin it all into gold. Well, now that she's proven that she can do this, you'd think the king would want to keep her happy and just just spinning over a long period of time. He would have seen all this gold and just be like, wow, your dad wasn't lying. All right, well, you work for me now. I'll get you whatever you want, take care of everything for you, just relax. Keep the gold coming. This king is a psychopath. We 
continue. Then the little man came again, and she gave him a ring from one of her fingers, and everything was spun into gold. However, on the third night, the king had her locked again, in another room that was larger than the other two and filled with straw. If you succeed, you shall become my wife, he said. Then the little man came again and spoke. I'll do everything for you one more time, but you must promise me your firstborn child that you have with the king. Out of desperation, she promised to do what he wanted. I mean, yeah, I guess she's really got no choice in the matter if, if failing means she'll be killed. But it doesn't say that he'd kill her if she fails this third time. It just says she'd be made queen if she succeeds. Regardless, at this point, you'd think she could be like, I used up all the magic inside of me the previous two nights, but... I've given you so much gold at this point that you should at least allow me to live, right? I and mean, she's literally given the king so much gold from the first two nights. That's just a random gift that he wouldn't have had without her. She could totally fail this third night, come up with an excuse, and really, she should be rewarded handsomely for the gold she's already provided. But, of course, that's not how stories work, so we've got to change the stakes for the third time. Here we go. And when the king saw once again... How the straw had been spun into gold, he took the miller's beautiful daughter for his wife. Soon thereafter, the queen gave birth, and the little man appeared before her and demanded the promised child. Hold on a second. So she did this third giant room full of straw, and then that was it? King didn't ask for any more straw turned into gold? It makes no sense. Why would the king be like, Okay, you did three nights worth. I'm going to marry you so you'll be around all the time, but we'll never turn any more straw into gold ever again. It's ridiculous. He'd end up with way more gold if he didn't do the, the three super high stakes nights system and instead was just like, take your time, go at your own pace, spend, spend a couple hours a day spinning straw into gold. He'd end up with way more gold. So much more gold. It's insane. I mean... I know she wouldn't have been able to do that because she can't actually turn straw into gold, but just thinking of this from the king's perspective, his decisions make zero sense. We continue. However, the queen offered the little man all that she could and all the treasures of the kingdom if he would let her keep her child, but it was all in vain. Then the little man said, In three days I'll come again to fetch the child, but if you know my name by then, you shall keep your child. Why? Why is he even giving her this option? He doesn't have to. Also, she spent three full nights with the guy. You'd think she should know his name, right? Ah, uh, I figured it out. This is him being pissed off that she didn't talk to him while he was spinning the gold with her and helping her out that way, or, or even care enough to even learn his name over the three nights they spent together with him spinning the gold for her. He's pissed off that she was rude and treated him like a servant. He's like, I thought we had a good working relationship. I thought we were friends. I literally helped you out and saved your life three times. And you don't give a shit about me. You don't even know my name. This is like if you live in a building and don't know the name of the doorman. No, it's worse. This is like if the doorman saved your life three separate times and you still didn't know his name. I'm on his side at this point. I mean, I know the maiden was put into this position through no fault of her own, but come on, be nice to the guy who's saving your life. Learn his name, at the very least. So yeah, this is payback. We continue. During the first and second nights, the queen tried to think of the little man's name, but she wasn't able to come up with a name and became completely depressed. Yeah, if she'd just been friendly and talked with him while he was spinning straw for three full nights to save her life, she'd be fine. Because on the first two nights, she definitely got the better end of the deal. All she had to do was give him a necklace and a ring. She could have tried to negotiate down the firstborn, too. He accepted jewelry and trinkets before, just be like, if I become queen, then I'll have access to whatever jewelry you want. He'll essentially be able to call in any favors he wants, forever. Having a friend who's the queen... He'll have a direct line, straight to the queen. Surely that's worth more than some random baby he's then got to take care of. 
But it's, it does sort of say that he insists on it, I guess. Ah, oh, I just had the thought that maybe he just really wants to be a dad. Oh, damn. That is actually really sad. If you think of it that way, then this guy is, is actually a pretty sympathetic character. Wow, I think I just reframed the entire story of Rumblestilskin to make him the unappreciated hero who gets totally screwed over. Damn, all right. We continue. On the third day, however, the king returned home from hunting and told her, I was out hunting the day before yesterday, and when I went deep into the forest, I came upon a small cottage, and in front of the house there was a ridiculous little man, hopping around as if he had only one leg and screeching, Today I'll brew, tomorrow I'll bake, soon I'll have the queen's namesake. Oh, how hard it is to play my game, for Rumpelstiltskin is my name. Oh, fuck off. The king just happened to cross paths with him as he is randomly shouting his name into the forest. That's the solution here? Bullshit. Totally unearned. When the queen heard this, she rejoiced. And when the dangerous little man came... Wait, he's, he's, why is he dangerous? He doesn't threaten her in any way. He didn't say, I'll kill you if you don't give me the child. He gave her a way to completely get out of their deal, which he didn't even have to do. There's no dangerous implications here. Anyway, when the dangerous little man came, he asked, What's my name, your highness? She responded first by guessing, Is your name Conrad? No. Is your name Henry? No. Oh, she's being a dick about it now. She knows his name and she's taunting him. Also, she gets multiple guesses. That's part of it. Man, he doesn't have to do any of this. He could just be like, we made a deal, give me the kid. But he's giving her a way out and multiple guesses. Jeez. And one of her guesses is Conrad? Fuck off. Don't be a dick, maiden. You know his name's not Conrad. Finally, she said, is your name Rumpelstiltskin? The devil told you that, the little man screamed, and he ran off full of anger and never returned. The end. Uh, all right. What if he was just like, no, nope, it's not Rumpelstiltskin either. She has no proof. Just lie. Fuck these people. We know the king is a psychopath. The queen is a total victim in all this. I readily admit that, but she made the deal, and now she should just renegotiate the deal. Or honor the deal. Have more kids. It sucks. It's tragic. But I guess you had no choice, really. But now that she's the queen, shouldn't she be able to renegotiate the deal? Just be like, look, I'm queen now. You're magic. You live in a cottage in the woods. That can't be super fun. You're clearly trying to better your standing or do something here if you're coming into the castle and trying to make deals and shit. Let's just start a partnership that we can both benefit from. We can help each other out here. You saved my life three times, and I'm very grateful for that. I'm sorry I didn't learn your name, but let's be friends now. You can help us. We can help you. We'll get you a great, nice, big house next to the castle. You don't have to jump around in the woods all day unless you want to, in which case we'll get you a nicer house in the woods. I'm sure we've got an orphanage in this kingdom with some kids who would be super stoked to have a eccentric dad like you, if you really want to be a father, let's work something out here. I know that's not a clean ending, but this isn't a clean story. It's chaos. And there are all these insane, nonsensical rules and circumstances. <laughs> There's hardly any logical motivation outlined for any character, other than the maiden not wanting to be killed for not spinning straw into gold. That's the only motivation that we understand, and that is spelled out for us. Other than that, we have no idea... Why anyone is doing anything. I mean, the king wants the gold, but the way he goes about it is totally insane. Speaking of which, there's so many questions about Rumblestiltskin himself. Where does he come from? How did he find out about the maiden having to spin straw into gold, and the fact that she couldn't actually do it? How did he then gain access to the room she was locked inside? How is he himself able to spin straw into gold? And yeah, why does he want this baby so badly? Does he just want to be a father? There's so many unanswered questions about Rumpelstiltskin. We need a, we need a Rumpelstiltskin origin story. That's what I want to see. But I'll admit, asking for someone's child is really not okay and really fucked up. You should have just asked for 
for more riches or whatever. But clearly he can't have children for whatever reason, and this is something he wants really badly. And it's part of a transaction, and he does save the maiden's life and make her queen. I think at that point, it might be kind of a, of a fair trade for saving her life. Again, I feel bad for saying that, but yeah, he's saving her life, so she's going to have to give him something very valuable in return, right? I'm just thinking from a unemotional story perspective. But yes, it is very tragic. But granted, you could say he's taking advantage of her. And yeah, he is. But people do that all the time, and we don't know his reasons. Maybe he just wants to be a father and would actually be a great father. The king is a psycho. He's not going to be a good dad. Maybe it would be better for the kid to not be the prince and live under this crazy asshole king and instead go off and live with Rumpelstiltskin. Maybe he, Rumpelstiltskin would be a great dad and would teach the kid magic powers and that child would go on to be the greatest, most benevolent king there ever was. Maybe that's what he's planning to do here. Maybe he's planning, he has some like gift of foresight as well as his magical, his other magical abilities and he's planning to raise the child and teach the child to be amazing because he knows the king won't and then the child would return to the kingdom as a hero. We don't know Rumpelstiltskin's intentions. Asking for the child is the only quote-unquote evil thing he does. And we don't know his intentions, so we don't know if it is actually evil at all. Regardless, he is the most honest and straightforward and upright character in the story. He makes deals and holds up his ends of the bargain every time. I don't know. So as far as lessons, I don't know. The Maiden doesn't really do anything just to try to preserve her own life, and things just sort of work out for her. She's definitely the victim here. She didn't ask for any of this, but none of the solutions to any problems are found through any sort of ingenuity or problem-solving. She gets thrown into this room with a straw because her dad is a lying idiot, then some random guy shows up and is like, hey, I can do this for you, and she's like, well, I don't want to die, so yeah, okay, I guess, deal. She does that three times and is then made queen. Then the guy shows up to collect on the deal, and she's like, I don't want to anymore. Sorry. So he's like, okay, if you remember my name, I'll let you keep your child. We spent three whole nights together, so you should know it. Tell me my name, and I'll totally let you off the hook for the deal. Just free and clear. She can't remember the name, but her husband happens to stumble across this guy dancing around, shouting his name into the, into the void, completely solving her problem. Zero actual problem solving took place on her part. On anyone's part, really. She just sort of stumbles through and things work out. Again, she is a victim for even being in this situation. But I like stories where the hero shows some ingenuity or, or kindness or cleverness or literally any personality traits whatsoever. She shows none. She doesn't even do anything to show she's a nice person. The opposite. If anything, she doesn't know Rumpelstiltskin's name after three nights with him. And then when she hears his name, through no credit of her own... She taunts him with fake guesses and is then like, yeah, I know it, bitch. I know you saved my life three times, but fuck off. So I don't know what lessons are intended with this story, really. I guess one of the actual lessons is that you shouldn't feel the need to try to impress people, and you certainly shouldn't lie to try to impress people. It can only lead to trouble. This is about the maiden's father, of course, who totally screws over his daughter by lying and saying she can spin straw into gold. Also, telling a lie to impress someone is pointless, because someone being impressed by you based on a lie means nothing. In fact, personally, it would make me feel even worse about myself, because it would make me feel like I'm not good enough to impress this person on my own merit. I have to lie for it. When in fact, maybe the Miller does good work and is impressive on his own. He raised a beautiful daughter as a single father. Being a single father and a Miller in olden times is probably pretty difficult. It's a pretty difficult life. That's worth feeling good about. But then he lies and sets his daughter up to be killed, so at that point, no, he shouldn't feel very good about himself anymore. <laughs> at that point, he's kind of an idiot, and would have gotten his daughter killed if not for the intervention of this random little magical man. Another lesson, know when to keep your mouth shut. If Rumblestiltskin hadn't been hopping around shouting his name into the air, he would have gotten what he wanted. Third lesson, sometimes bad people suffer no consequences, because the king is really the villain of this story. He's the only one who threatens to kill the maiden, or threatens to harm anyone, and he threatens to kill her for no reason, and forces her into this entire horrible situation. And he just ends up with a beautiful bride and a ton of gold that he didn't have before. So, 
He's both the villain and the biggest winner of this story. Nothing bad ever happens to him. (laughs) If the maiden is smart, she'll kill him at some point and take his throne, because he's clearly a horribly evil ruler, but we don't get that far in this story. And the last lesson, if you make a deal with someone, just hold them to it, or better yet, renegotiate the deal from a position of strength. Rumpelstiltskin didn't renegotiate, he just weakened his own position by giving her a way out of the deal. Bad move. He should have just been like, fine, you can keep your baby, but instead you gotta give me, and then just name whatever he wants. He could demand way more, because she's not honoring their initial deal. It says she, like, offers him all the riches of the kingdom. Take all the riches of the kingdom, man. Probably get a kid with that much riches. I mean, that's really sad to think about. But it's true, so there's another lesson. Know your leverage, and don't be afraid to come up with creative solutions. They could have found a solution that made both of them happy. I genuinely believe that. Instead, Rumpelstiltskin got screwed. All right, let's adapt this thing. I think it would be good as a movie. Maybe you can make this a miniseries. It'll take place in modern day, and will star Jason Sudeikis as a big shot at an advertising company. He's not like a partner at the company, but he's high up. He's a, he's a hot shot. Total hot shot type character. Maybe a bit sleazy, but but a bit likable as well. Sort of charming in how sleazy he is. And he's in a rut. He can't come up with anything decent for the accounts he's working on, and it's getting bad. And one day, his boss comes up and is like, Listen, Sudeikis, we've got three big meetings in the next three days. You wanted these accounts. You pushed everyone away. You said they were your territory. You've called your shot. Now you got to deliver. Now, I know you ruffle feathers around here, but so far you've gotten results. But if you drop the ball on these, I won't be able to keep you on. we got the meeting for the big soft drink campaign tomorrow, and we need something good. And Jason Sudeikis is like, oh, I'll knock it out of the park, sir. I'm going to stay in the office all night, work on it the whole night. But inside, he is totally panicking, and he just can't come up with a slogan for this soft drink. He hates everything he's coming up with, so he's pulling his hair out, and late at night, the janitor comes through and is cleaning everything out, and the janitor will be played by Jason Manzoukas, another really funny comedian. And I'm going to refer to him as Manzoukas to avoid confusion, since they're both named Jason. So Manzoukas comes into Jason's office and is friendly and upbeat, while Jason Sudeikis is super stressed out, pulling his hair out. Manzuka sees the picture of the lemon-lime soft drink all over the office, and he's like, Oh, I love that drink. Yeah, I drink that all the time. I always say it's... Uh, it's this funny thing I, I just always say. I always say it's fizzy fresh. Every time I take that first sip, I go, Ah, fizzy fresh. <laughs> Great stuff. Anyway, have a good night, pal. And Jason Sudeikis is just, he's just annoyed and is ushering him out of the room. And the next day at the meeting, Jason Sudeikis, he pitches a couple of his own ideas and they just fall totally flat. The soft drink people hate them. His own company people hate them. And so in an act of desperation, he says, well, what do you think of this? Fizzy fresh. We have an ad where we, where a cool hip youth takes a sip of an ice cold can and says, ah, fizzy fresh. And the soft drink people just go head over heels for it. They'll love it. After the meeting, Sudeik is his boss. He's like, good work in there. But tomorrow's meeting with the running shoe company, it's an even bigger client. So, so we'll need your A game on that one. Come in with something hot. Again, a lot riding on this. And so the same thing happens. Jason Sudeik is at the office all night. And he's hating everything he's coming up with for the running shoe campaign. And yet again, Manzukis comes strolling in, clean out the trash. And he's super friendly. He's like, hey, staying late again, eh? Well, I'll tell you. It's nice to see a friendly face in this place. Usually it's just me alone. Even though Jason Sudeikis' face is definitely not friendly. And this time, Sudeikis, he doesn't rush him out. He points to the picture of the shoes and he's like, you see that shoe? What, what does that shoe make you think of? And Manzukis is like, it looks like that shoe can really go fast, go far. Hey, you know, I like that. Go fast, go far. Our word's fun. You know, I applied for an advertising job here a while ago, but never heard anything back. That's, that's why I'm stuck cleaning out the trash. It's not so bad, though. I want to be where you are one day, though. That's the dream. Your ideas, they must be amazing. You must have phenomenal ideas. Anyway, I'll let you get back to it. Have a good night. And the next day at the meeting, Sudeikis pitches a couple of his own ideas, and yet again, they fall totally flat. Everyone hates them. And finally, he sighs, and he says, All right, well, what about this? Simple. Go fast, 
go far, and everyone freaks out. They love it. And they're in, a, they're in this glass conference room in the middle of all the offices. And as everyone's celebrating, Jason Sudeikis turns to see Manzukis. He's looking through the glass at the words on the board, just go fast, go far, up on the screen with a picture of the shoes. And he looks super confused. And then he looks back at Sudeikis. And, and so Jason Sudeikis is like, shit. And as he's leaving, his boss stops him and says, you are on a roll, man. Brilliant. So clean. So so direct. And now we've got our biggest client coming in tomorrow, and I spoke with the other partners. They were skeptical, but after this role you're on, if you nail that one too, they've agreed to make you full partner. You'll have ownership of the company, a seat on the board, the whole deal. And so he leaves the conference room, and he sees Manzukis, who's like, was that my slogan? And Sudeikis is like, we kind of came up with it together, you know, right? Manzukis says, no, I, I came up with that. Pretty, pretty on my own. I remember. You just, you just asked... What do you think of those shoes? And then I came up with the go fast, go far thing. And so Jason today is like, look, okay, this is what the business is like, all right? Ideas are a dime a dozen. You got one lucky hit. Nobody will believe you if you try to take credit, okay? So just get back to the trash. And Manzukas is all sad and dejected. And that night, Sudeikis is back in his office. And of course, he hates everything he's coming up with for the big tech company client tomorrow. And Manzukas comes in. To take out the trash, but of course he's quiet and keeps to himself after Sudeikis was an asshole to him. But Sudeikis is desperate, so he's like, Look, I'll be honest. Man, I need you on this one. What did what do you what do you want? And Mitsukis is like, What? Sudeikis says, Don't be smart with me, just tell me what you want and help me come up with something for this tech company. And Mitsukis perks up and he's like, A job here, a good job here, not entry level. I want to come up with slogans and stuff. Good salary. And Sudeikis says, fine, done. If you give me something good and the tech guys love it, I'll be able to get you that job because I'll be partner. It's yours. Just now help me out. So Manzukas looks at the pictures of the tech equipment and the handheld devices, and he says, you know, everything they make looks like it's from the future. So maybe something like your future in the palm of your hand. And Sudeikis is like, your future in the palm of your hand. That's not, it's not bad. So the next day, the tech company comes in, and sure enough, they love that slogan. And Manzukis sees this from outside the glass the glass meeting room. And Sudeikis gives him a smile and a nod. Manzukis like pumps his fist in the air like, yeah. So everything's great. And the boss is like, congratulations, Sudeikis, your partner now. And as he leaves the meeting, he sees Manzukis all excited. And he tells him, just be cool. We'll talk about it tonight. I'll, I'll get you all set up with that job. But Sudeikis starts to worry. He, he thinks that if he randomly gives the janitor a really good advertising job, people will will ask questions, and it'll come out that all these ideas that everyone loved were from Manzukis. So he decides, I gotta kill Manzukis. So that night, Manzukis comes into his office like, we did it, super excited for the job, man. I can't wait. I'm so glad that companies like my slogans. And hey, no hard feelings for you taking my idea before. I, I get it. It's business, you know? And Sudeikis is like, yeah, well, all worked out. Now, now let's have a drink to celebrate. He's planning on poisoning him with a scotch, but Manzukis is like, oh, I don't drink alcohol. And besides, I don't, I don't need any. I'm just so happy. And so Sudeikis is like, shit, what am I going to do? And he has to adjust. So he's talking about how thankful he is for Manzukis' ideas, and he walks behind him. And Manzukis is like sitting down in front of his desk. And he takes a cord, and he starts trying to strangle him. And Manzukis is like, why? And Sudeikis says, because I can't have anyone know I took all your ideas. And there's a struggle, and they tumble out of the door into the hall. And there they're surprised to see the boss with a couple of the partners, like, walking through the hall. They're just there late. And he's like, what's going on here? And Sudeikis says, this, this janitor just attacked me. Arrest him. But Manzukis says, that's a lie. He attacked me. It's because he's been stealing my ideas. And Sudeikis says, this man is insane. Arrest him now. And they're about to side with Sudeikis when Manzukis says, wait, I can prove it. And he pulls out one of the phones from the tech company earlier and he says, you know, these look so nice that I went out and bought one earlier today. I thought I could afford it with my new job, but wanted to make sure you held up your end of the bargain. And he shows that the microphone is on and he recorded their entire meeting leading up to the attack with Jason Sudeikis admitting to stealing his ideas and saying he needs to kill him to cover it up. And Sudeikis gives him a look like, you bastard. And Manzukis holds up the phone, and he just whispers, My future in the palm of my hand, bitch. So Sudeikis is arrested and thrown in jail, and Manzukis is given a big new job at the company. 
because they're like, you really came up with all these slogans? That's fantastic. And sure enough, in a few years, Manzukis becomes partner, and he lives happily ever after the end. And that will do it for this week's story session. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. Come on back next week for a story titled Sweetheart Roland. Ah, that sounds nice. I'm just surprised to have a male main character who isn't named Hans, for starters. Sweetheart Roland sounds nice, though. Maybe for once we won't have a super dark, fucked up story. Or maybe it'll be a total double cross and our boy Roland will descend into complete chaos. Only one way to find out. Come on back next week. My name is Zach Stewart, and these are the Shadow Bear Story Sessions.